Shakti Pods here too. Nagarjuna says, nothing whatever arises. Nothing whatever arises. Not from itself, not from another, not from both itself and another, and not without a cause. And there's an asterisk and it says, that is not from neither itself nor another. There are just four conditions of the existence of anything. Efficient cause, supporting condition, precipitating condition, and dominant condition. There is no fifth condition. Among the four conditions of the existence of a thing, there is found no substantial essence of the thing. If things have no substantial essences, then there can be no real relations between different things. And at this point, there's another um, asterisk. In describing the efficient cause supporting condition, etc., with regard to an existent thing, its efficient cause is that which produces it. Its supporting condition is that which preserves it in existence. Its precipitating condition is that which makes it an object of experience. For example, uh, the presence of a table before me is the precipitating condition of my perceiving a table. And its dominant condition is the purpose for which it exists. Madhyamaka means the middle way or path. And Madhyamika means one who follows the middle way. Nagarjuna's philosophy is an attempt to avoid the extremes of essentialism, quote-unquote, and nihilism, quote-unquote. Essentialism is the view that the true reality is made up of eternal, unchanging, independent, and substantial essences, self-essences as well as thing essences. And nihilism is the view that there are no such essences and that there is therefore nothing exists at all. Nagarjuna's view is that, contrary to nihilism, there does exist the world of selves and things, namely the world that appears before us. But that, contrary to essentialism, all phenomenal entities are continually changing, interdependent, empty. So continuing from his book, things arise from conditions. There is no arising. Aren't conditions not conditions? Things arise from conditions. But if there is no arising, aren't conditions not conditions? There are no conditions of existing things, nor are there conditions of that which does not exist. How can the non-existent have a condition? If something exists, does it need a condition? So the purpose, what he's trying to set up here, is that if you think about it, and you take, you can, you can get an infinite regress going. Meaning that if you, if you accept that one thing is precipitated by another thing, and this is our misunderstanding when we think of when did the universe begin, quote unquote. And I've never really understood that perfectly from, or even at all from from esoteric scriptures when they say that before that there was the universe there was this thing I've always understood it in a more holographic way meaning that they're talking about different layers of reality which are always on top of one another rather than some kind of linear sequence of events which happens because how can there be a linear sequence of causality all the way back to some beginning There's no beginning, because the beginning would have to arise from a previous condition which gave it a beginning. That's what he's saying. You can't, you can't go back logically to, to say that things existed from previous causes. What was the first cause before the first cause, before the first cause, before the first cause, etc.? And he's trying to make the point that things don't arise.
that in this moment, here we are. Neither manifest or unmanifest. Neither in contact with the material energy or not in contact with the material energy. Neither God nor Jiva. Neither dual or non-dual. Continue from his text a little. If there are no existence, nor non existence, nor existent non existence, how can there be any causes? If there are a cause, what would it cause? If there are any events, for example, mental states without supporting conditions, why should we speak of supporting conditions at all? For example, your mind is clear. You have a clear mind. What is the previous cause to the effect of the clear mind? Or what is the effect of the cause of the clear mind? The causality is so intertwined as to be neither cause or effect. but a motion, a process, a movement, a flowing. If things do not exist, if things do not begin to exist, excuse me, if things do not begin to exist, then they cannot cease to exist. If things do not begin to exist, then they cannot cease to exist. You follow? If things do not begin to exist, how can they have precipitating conditions? If something has ceased to exist, how can it be a condition or cause of anything else? <laughs> so it's saying in the essentialist view or in the nihilist view causality makes no sense. If things have no substantial essences then they have no real essence and in that case the statement this is the cause or condition of that is meaningless. An effect can be found in a single cause or condition. Or excuse me, an effect cannot be found in a single cause or condition. Nor can an effect be found in all causes and conditions together. How can something found in causes and conditions arise from them? If an effect arises from causes or conditions in which it did not pre-exist, in which it does not pre-exist, then couldn't it arise from no causes or conditions at all? If an effect arises from causes or conditions in which it does not pre-exist, then couldn't it arise from no causes or conditions at all? So this is saying, if we're presupposing that the reality arose from a God who is causeless, who has no causes, Sarva Karana Karanam, who is the cause of causes, If we're saying that the reality arose from a God who is causeless, then 
Couldn't it arise from no causes or condition or conditions at all? Here's the key thing to understand. If we're saying that the reality arose from a causeless cause, then what's why can't we just say that the effects arose from nothing? From no causes or conditions whatsoever. If an effect arises from causes or conditions in which it does not pre-exist, then couldn't it arise from no causes or conditions at all? If an effect is created by its conditions, but the conditions are not self-created, how could the effect ever come to be? Therefore, effects cannot arise from causes or conditions, nor can they arise from non-causes or non-conditions. If there are no effects whatsoever, how can there be any causes or conditions? Or, for that matter, any non-causes or non-conditions? A key cornerstone of Buddhist philosophy is called Pratitya Samutpara. Pratitya uh, Samutpara. It means dependent origination. And this states that all phenomena are arising together in a mutually interdependent web of cause and effect. The interdependence and mutual conditioning of phenomena is, according to Buddhist philosophy, a, crit a critical dimension of the universal natural law which makes liberation possible. Dependent co-arising. On one side of the chain, we're connected completely to an unlimited chain of karma. And in another way, we're connected to an infinite chain of liberation. So aren't I neither? And isn't the causality causeless? The only way that I could detach myself from the infinite cause and effect relationship of suffering is if the cause is causeless. Does that make sense? The, the point of Genesis is this moment and it's a causeless cause so let me continue with this uh, text what has already happened is not now happening. What has not yet happened is not now happening. What is now happening is not already happened. Nor has it not yet happened. Doesn't this mean that nothing can happen? What is happening is in the process of happening now. What has already happened and what has not yet happened are in the process of happening now. 
are not in the process, excuse me. What is happening is in the process of happening now. What has already happened and what has not yet happened are not in the process of happening now. How is the happening of the now happening possible? If there is no happening at all, then the now happening cannot happen. What is happening now might not happen, but it seems that what is happening now is happening, doesn't it? If what is happening now is happening now, then in the happening of what is happening now, there are two happenings. One, that which is happening now, and two, that which is the happening of that which is happening now. If there are two happenings, then there must be two things that happen, two happeners, for there cannot be a happening without a happener. If we can't say that anything is happening unless there is a happener, something that happens, then if nothing is happening, how could there be a happener, something that happens? If the conditions that create cause and effect are not self-created, then they are created of by something other than themselves, which, if not self-created, would be created by something other than itself, and so on to infinity. The present effect could never be created. So there's a self-created, codependent genesis taking place. It's almost as if there is a transcendental touchstone, a, a money gem in everyone's heart. And the reality is like arising from this money gem, this, this, this causeless cause. And this money gem is in all places at all times. the causeless cause whatever happens must either have what's either be something ha that happens a happener or something that does not happen a non happener if neither a happener nor a non happener happens what else is there that could happen if nothing happens there cannot be a happener since a happener is something that happens there is no happener, then we cannot say that a happener happens. Someone who thinks that a happener happens, that is, that something that is that happens happens, must also think that there must be a ha that there can be a happener even when nothing is happening. Because the happener and the happening are being thought of as two different things. Cause and effect are really cause effect self-generated codependent mutual cause effect beginningless beginning if a happener were to happen then we would have two happenings the happener the happening of the happener and the happening of the happening what is happening now doesn't begin with what has already happened nor does it begin with what has not yet happened nor does it begin with what is happening now that is with itself something that happens cannot cause itself to happen because then it would have to exist before it exists which is impossible where then is the beginning of what is happening now we cannot find the beginning of what is happening now in that which is prior to the beginning of what is now that is, in that which has already come and gone. Nor can we find it in that which has not yet happened. Therefore, where then is it? We can distinguish between what has already happened, what is happening now, and what has not yet happened. But we cannot find the beginning of what is happening now anywhere. We can distinguish between things that happen, happeners, things that do not happen, non-happeners. Happeners are not standing still, but non-happeners are not standing still either. Is this because non-happeners do not exist and what does not exist cannot be standing still or anything else? Uh, this is the side note. Other than happeners and non-happeners, what else is there that can be standing still? 
The idea of a non-moving happener, that is something happening that doesn't happen, is nonsensical. Something happening without happening never happens. Something that happens does not stop happening because it is happening, one, or two, because it's already happened, or three, because it has not yet happened. Happening is the same as beginning to happen, and having already happened is the same as ceasing to happen. It doesn't make sense to say that the happener is the same as the happening, or that the happener is different from the happening. If the happener were the same as the happening, then actor and action, deed and doer, would be identical. If the happener were different from the happening, they would follow that there could be happeners without happenings and happenings without happeners. If happener and happening are neither identical nor different, then how should we understand them? When something that happens happens, it isn't caused to happen by its happening. It isn't caused to happen by its happening since it has no existence before it happens. So is there in fact anything that happens? Something that happens doesn't show itself in a happening other than the happening by which it shows itself. Something that happens cannot show itself in two distinct happenings. An existent happener, a happener's happening, does not happen in any of the three ways, that is, neither past nor in the future nor even in the present. A non-existent happener's happening also does not happen in any of the three ways. Since a non-exister cannot happen at all. Therefore, neither an existent nor non-existent happener's happening happens in any of the three ways. The happening, the happener, and the happened are all non-existent. What I take from this is that he's elaborately tricking the mind out of its dualistic game of thinking that it has a set identity which began at a certain point, created a series of effect causal relationships, and became this set thing which is a cause of other things and is an effect of itself. In reality, You are a process, movement, Happening, happener, and happen are all non existent. The happening, happener, and happened are all non existent. So this, this kind of allows your mind to settle, settle on the pure clear light of itself.
and to view and perceive all of what is as a, a kind of like a hole within a hole as an impermanent movement not saying what is or what isn't or what isn't isn't seeing everything as impermanent dynamic motion cause of reality cannot exist from them some unmanifested thing which has a cause before it before it before it but from a causeless codependent impermanent movement which renders all holes as whole. Which is in all places at the same time. No places. And in between. kind of difficult to talk about you kind of the the, the way that, that Nagarjuna phrases it kind of leaves it for your own consciousness to experience what he's saying but talking positively about what it is is slightly more difficult I think he actually does this in the book though uh, somewhere so chapter 7 arising enduring and dissolving if arising arises then it would have the three characteristics of that which arises, arising, enduring, and dissolving, represented by Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. Um, that is, like all things that arise, arising would arise, endure for a time, and cease to exist. If arising does not arise, how could it be characteristic of that which arises? If the arising, enduring, and dissolving occur separately, then they cannot be the characteristics of arising. But how could they occur simultaneously? That is, how could they, how could arising arise, endure, and dissolve all at the same time? If arising has characteristics other than arising, enduring, and dissolving, then there will be an infinite regress. Because these other characteristics, quote unquote, will have to arise, endure, and dissolve, and their arising, enduring, and dissolving will have to arise, endure, and dissolve, and so on to infinity. If arising has characteristics other than arising, enduring, and dissolving, then there would be an infinite regress. If it has no characteristics at all, then it cannot arise. Perhaps there is a non-arising of arising, a non-arising arising of arising. That is, an ontological foundation arising that does not arise from anything else. Or an ontologically foundational arising that does not arise from anything else. Perhaps there is a non-arising arising of arising. And perhaps this non-arising, arising of arising gives rise to the arising of ordinary phenomena. If there is a non-arising, arising of arising, then what is the then then it is the primary source of all arising. 
But if it is non-arising, how can it be the arising of arising? If the arising of an ordinary phenomena arises from the foundational arising of all arising, what explains the existence of that foundational arising? If the arising of the arising of ordinary phenomena is non-arising, then its existence cannot be explained. The arising of the arising of ordinary phenomena is non-arising, then its existence cannot be explained. Can we say that the arising of the arising of ordinary phenomena gives rise to itself as well as to the arising of ordinary phenomena, just as the lamp illuminates itself as well as other things? If arising of the arising of ordinary phenomena is non-arising, how can it give rise to itself? If it is given rise to either by itself or by something else, if it is if it is given rise to either by itself or by something else, then it is not non-arising. The non-arising, not yet arisen, and the arising. There is no arising in any of them. They are like the non-happening, the not yet happening, and the happening. If the now arising is not given rise to by a, pre pre a prior arising, then how can its arising be dependent? Contrary to the central Buddhic dogma. If now arising's arising is dependent on that which gives rise to it, then the now arising is peaceful. But the now arising and that which gives rise to it are peaceful. Why peaceful? Is it because the dependence of the now arising makes the now arising also dependent? Also, all of which is in keeping with the doctrine of independent ari interdependent arising. Interesting. If the now arising's arising is dependent on that which gives rise to it, then the now arising is peaceful. Both the now arising and that which gives rise to it are peaceful. If the non arising exists, then it must have arisen. If the non arising does not exist, then how could it arise? If the arising of the now arising arises, what gives rise to it? If an earlier arising gives rise to the arising of the now arising, then there is an infinite regress. Because there must have been an even earlier arising that gives rise to the earlier arising and so on. The now arising could never arise. So he's saying that if there is a previous something which happened, which gave arise, which gave uh, aroused this moment, there must be an infinite regress, and where do you find the very first condition which gave rise to this now moment? It's impossible. If the non-arising exists, it must have arisen. If the non-arising does not exist, how could it arise? Um, if an earlier arising gives rise to the arising of the now arising, then there is an infinite regress. But if that which gives rise to the the, the all arising is non arising, then the now arising could arise. But if that which gives rise to all arising is non arising, then the now arising could arise. Therefore, Neither being nor non-being can arise, as stated in chapter 1, verse 6. We cannot say that the dissolving of a thing arises because that which is dissolving is no longer arising, nor can we say that, that, that the arisen is not dissolving because all things have arisen, that have arisen are dissolving. That is, no phenomenal things are impermanent or immutable. They are all impermanent. An enduring thing that has arisen does not endure. A non-enduring thing does not endure. That which has arisen is dissolving and therefore not enduring. 
how can that which has not arisen be enduring? That which is dissolving is not enduring. All that has arisen is dissolving. All living beings that have arisen are subject to aging and death. Are there any living beings that do not age and die? Enduring cannot endure through itself, nor cannot, can it endure through another enduring, just as arising can neither arise from itself nor arise from another arising. The dissolve does not dissolve. The not yet dissolve does not yet dissolve. The dissolving of that which is dissolved does not dissolve. Can the non-arising dissolve? Non-arisen dissolve. Neither the enduring nor the non-enduring dissolves. The enduring that is permanent endures and does not dissolve. The non-enduring has dissolved and therefore cannot dissolve. The endurance of a thing cannot explain its ceasing to endure, nor can its ceasing to endure be explained by, through the endurance of something else, for example, the endurance of dissolving. No arising, no dissolving. That which is cannot dissolve. That which is cannot not be. That which is not cannot dissolve. Can the beheaded be beheaded a second time? Dissolving does not dissolve itself, nor is it dissolved by another dissolving. Just as arising can neither arise from itself, nor from another arising. Since arising, enduring, and dissolving cannot happen, there are no real things that arise, endure, or dissolve. There are no such things. How can the ordinary phenomenal world exist? It's all a dream, an illusion, like a city of gods floating in the heavens. So much for arising, enduring, and dissolving. The action, uh, the agent, and the action. A real, uh, a real which is permanent and thus cannot change or act. Something which is real is permanent and thus cannot change or act. A real agent is not an agent, that is, cannot act. An unreal, non-existent agent is not an agent, that is, cannot act. That which is, does not act. Action in a world of beings would be an action without an agent. An agent in a world of beings would be an agent without an action. An agent in the world, a world of real beings would be an agent and without an action. So it's very subtle what they're saying. If the agent is a non-arising, if the agent is a, presumed to be a without any cause, then how can an effect arise from that, what he's saying? There is a chain, there is a, a movement, a motion. If a non-existent agent performs a non-existent action, then both action and agent would be uncaused. No cause, no effect, no cause, no agent, no act, no agent, no activity, no power to act, no activity, no action. If there is no action as implied by both essentialism and nihilism, then nothing arises. If nothing arises, then there is no phenomenal world. If there is no phenomenal world, then there is no path to liberation and ordinary existence is without purpose. It cannot be that an agent is both real and unreal. An agent that is both real and unreal performs actions that are both real and unreal. It is impossible for the same thing to be both real and unreal at the same time. It cannot be that a real agent performs an unreal action. It cannot be that an unreal agent performs a real action. From believing these things, all sort of errors follow. It cannot be that a real agent performs an action that is either unreal or both real and unreal. It cannot be that an unreal agent performs an action that is either real or both real and unreal. It cannot be that an agent that is both real and unreal performs an action that is either unreal or both real and unreal. We must say 
that action depends on the agent and the agent depends on the action. Agent and action cannot exist independently of each other. From this negation of independently existing agents and actions, an understanding of clinging should arise. Through this analysis of action and agent, all else should be comprehended. We must say that action depends on the agent, and the agent depends on the action. Agent and action cannot exist independently of each other. Chapter 15, Essence and Existence. It makes no sense to say that essence arises from causes and conditions. If essence were caused or conditioned, it would, be not a, a, it would not be the essence. Essence cannot be created or otherwise come to be. Essence is not artificial, nor does it depend on another. If there are essences, then there are real differences between things. Are the entities without essences? Then there are no real differences between them. If we cannot find an entity with an essence, then it does not prove of the non-existence of entities. Uh, that does not prove the non-existence of, of such entities. Some say that an entity that changes is a non-entity. Those who think in terms of essences and real differences, and who recognize entities without essences, do not grasp the truth taught by the Buddha, which is that the phenomenal world and everything else is devoid or empty. of said essences. The Buddha counseled against saying that it is and it is not. The Buddha counseled against saying it is and it is not. If only entities with essences really exist, then there is no non-existence, nor can anything change. Some will say if there are no essences, what is there to change? We reply, if there are essences, what is there to change? To say it is, is to be too attached to essentialism. Essentialism, uh, the view that things are really real, eternalism, etc. Is the view that things are really real, eternal, immutable, and independently existing essences. The theory is also referred to as eternalism or permanentism. If there are essences, what is there to change? Uh, to say it is is to be too attached to essentialism. To say it is not is to lapse into nihilism. Therefore, a judgment of it is or it is not are not made by the wise. An entity with an essence cannot non-exist. This is essentialism. It existed before, but now it doesn't. This is nihilism.
next uh, self and reality if the self were the empirical personality ego then it would arise and dissolve if we're different from the empirical personality then it would neither arise nor dissolve no self, no propensities of a self, no self, no I or mine. No I or mine, no separate existence. No I or mine, no belief in essential differences. No I or mine, neither internally nor externally. Clinging ceases. No clinging, no rebirth. When clinging and misery cease, there is nirvana. Clinging and misery arise from false consciousness, from delusion. Delusion ceases when delusion ceases when emptiness shunyata is realized. Some teach self atma, some teach no self anatman. The Buddhas teach neither self nor no self. What language describes is non-existent. What thought describes is non-existent. Things neither arise nor dissolve, just as in nirvana. The world is real, the world is not real, the world is both real and not real. The world is neither real nor not real. None of these is true, according to the teaching of the Buddha. Not dependent, quiescent, not a product of false consciousness, not a mental construction at all, without distinctions, no purpose. This is the nature of ultimate reality. Something whose arising depends on another is neither identical to nor different from the other. Therefore, it is neither non-existent nor eternal. Something whose arising depends on another is neither identical to nor different from the other. Therefore, it is neither non-existent nor eternal. emptiness in the Four Noble Truths. If all were empty of essence, then nothing could arise or dissolve. Then it would follow that even the Four Noble Truths could not exist. In the, if the Four Noble Truths did not exist, then true knowledge, renunciation of the world, spiritual progress, and enlightenment would be impossible. If knowledge, renunciation, spiritual progress, and enlightenment did not exist, then the four fruits, stages of advancement along the Eightfold Noble Path would not exist, and if the fruits did not exist, there would be no attaining of the fruits and no advancement towards Nirvana. If those eight things mentioned in verses 2 and 3 did not exist, then there could be no Buddhist community, etc., uh, etc., et no, no true teaching, no Dharma. If the, sarma, if the Sangha and Dharma did not exist, then how could the Buddha exist? 
The Madhyamaka doctrine of emptiness destroys the three jewels of Buddhism. Thus, the doctrine of emptiness negates the existence of act, uh, negates the existence of actions of the four fruits of the Dharma and also of those things taken for granted in the ordinary and everyday thought of the unenlightened. Your understanding of our teaching on emptiness is defective, and by failing to understand it, you are in danger of losing the truth in which you are suffering. Um, this 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 verse is a response. Actually, this this verse is a response to a critic of his uh, philosophy, who charged that it was a form of nihilism, and he seeks to refute this in this uh, statement. Your understanding of our teaching on emptiness is defective, and by failing to understand, you are in danger of losing the truth, which will cause you suffering. In the Dharma taught by the Buddhas, there is distinction between the two levels of, levels of truth. Conventional, confused truth of ordinary consciousness and the true truth revealed to superconsciousness. If you don't understand the two truth distinction, then you cannot understand the profound teaching of the Buddha. Understanding conventional truth is a prerequisite for grasping ultimate truth, and without an understanding of ultimate truth, you cannot attain nirvana. By failing to understand emptiness, those of little intelligence can be destroyed, like someone grabbing at a snake by the head or casting a spell improperly. Thus, realizing how few are capable of learning the deep truths of the Dharma, the Buddha was reluctant to teach it to the many. Your attempt at refutation of our teaching on emptiness is off target. Your criticisms do not apply. Our understanding of emptiness is quite different from yours. A correct understanding of emptiness makes everything clear. For those with a defective understanding of emptiness, nothing works out. You are attributing your own misunderstandings to us. That's like someone who mounts a horse then forgets that he is mounted. If you view all existing things as having essences, then you must view all things as having no causes and no conditions. If essentialism is true, then there can be no causes, no effects, no agents, nor act, no actions, no conditions, no arising, no cessation, and no consequences of action. Whatever emerges out of the process of interdependent arising we call emptiness. Speaking of interdependent arising as emptiness is the standard practice of those who follow the middle way, Madhyamaka. Since there are no things that are not independent interdependently originated since there are no things that are not interdependently originated it follows that there are no things that are not empty of essence if all things were not empty of essence then contrary to reviews nothing could arise and dissolve it is actually your view that rules out the existence of the four noble truths So he's saying that this is a living truth. It's living. It's not some objective thing which never could arise. You see, if you say that the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, if you subscribe to the essentialist, what he's calling the essentialism, then you're saying that these things could not have arised and could not have affected us. Because something which is um, speaking of, of the, the Four Noble Truths, Dharma Sangha, in such a way as, as saying it's like an objective kind of eternal uncaused causeless thing then it couldn't have any effect of affecting us if the if the four noble truths if the absolute reality were something taintless spotless unchanging objective unborn all of these things which most spiritualists hold to without really thinking of it too much then it could not have any effect on us because where is the cause and the effect arising from it, it can't produce an effect if it 
is existing in this kind of isolated way, independent of the motion of interdependence between all things. You know what I'm trying to say? These truths are dynamic and contained within, not some objective thing outside which in some kind of nonsensical way is is has a no cause but yet produces effect everything is interdependently arising moment to moment from within so in that way the Buddha Dharma, the Sangha, becomes an actual, real, living reality and not just an objective thing. Some kind of like, you know, abstract theorizing or abstract impersonal truth. It's very subtle and what he's saying here is important too. He said that the Buddha, uh, thus realizing how few are capable of learning the deep truths of the Dharma, the Buddha was reluctant to teach it to the many. Which is true. He knew that his, his truth was so profound and so subtle that most people would just completely not be able to understand it. So continuing. Whatever emerges out of the process of interdependent arising we call emptiness. Speaking of interdependent arising as emptiness is the standard practice for those who follow the middle way, Madhyamaka. Since there are no things that are not interdependently originated, it follows that there are no things that are not empty of essence. All, if all things were not empty of essence, then contrary to your view, nothing could arise or dissolve. It is actually your view that rules out the existence of the Four Noble Truths. If all things were not interdependently originated, then there could be no suffering. Suffering is impermanent and cannot exist in something that has a self-nature, a substantial essence. Something with a self-nature cannot originate. Therefore, if you deny emptiness, there can be no arising. Emptiness is, is like a hole, like a void which is filled moment to moment with an interdependent web of causality which arises in an interdependent way from within. And the cause and the effect are within one another. But don't originate from an objective thing out there. But rather the origination is interdependent in each moment, paradoxically. Something with the self-nature cannot originate. Therefore, if you deny emptiness, there can be no arising. If something has a self-nature, then there can be no cessation of suffering. An essence cannot seek to cease to exist. How can an essence seek to exist? How can this eternally existing thing, suffering, seek to exist if it's essential? If the Noble Eightfold Path has a self, had a self-nature, then it could not be followed. Since the path is followed, it cannot have a self-nature. If suffering arising and cessation did not exist, then there could be no path leading to the cessation of suffering. If ignorance had an essence, then knowledge would be impossible. An essence is permanent. For the same reason, renunciation, realization, Following the path and the four fruits, stages of attainment would be impossible. Moreover, the four fruits are essences that are unattained. Then how could they be attained ever? 
If the four fruits did not exist, there could be not experience. Without the fruits, without attainers and experiences thereof, there could be no Sangha, a community. Without the Four Noble Truths, there would be no Dharma. If the Sangha and the Dharma did not exist, then how could the Buddha exist? The view of, the, of you, the critic of Madhyamaka, of expounded implies that the Buddha arises independently of enlightenment, and also that enlightenment arises independently of the Buddha. For you, someone who has, by nature, by essence, is not enlightened, can never attain enlightenment, no matter how diligently he might strive. If your view were correct, then, not, then no one could ever do right or wrong as defined in the Dharma. What can that which is not empty of essence do? Essence is unchanging and thus inactive. Since for you the four fruits are essences, they cannot arise from right or wrong actions. And if they did arise from right or wrong actions, then they would not exist. Because in essentialism, arising is unreal. If, however, you claim that the four fruits can arise from right or wrong actions and still exist, on your assumptions, the fruits cannot be emptied of essence, but because in, essen in essentialism, only essences can exist. In denying that interdependent arising is emptiness and that emptiness is interdependent arising, you also negate all of the conventions of everyday thought and actions. The denial of emptiness implies, one, that there are no actions, which is contrary to the fact of experience. Uh, two, that there are actions without beginning and end, which is incredible. And three, that there are agents of actions without actions, which is contradictory, since an agent is, by definition, a performer of actions. In a world of essences, everything would be unchanging. There would be no changes of circumstances from time to time, and nothing would either begin or end. If all is empty of essence, as we claim, then renunciation of all actions and worldly definements, the ending of suffering and attainment and enlightenment are all impossible. Are, are, all, are all possible. If everything is es empty of essences. He who sees interdependent arising also sees suffering, the arising and cessation thereof, and the Noble Eightfold Path. Nirvana. If all is empty of essence, then there is no real arising and no real dissolving. Through what dissolving can Nirvana arise? If all is not empty, if all is non-empty of essence, then there is no real arising and no real dissolving. Through what di dissolving can nirvana arise? Not abandoned, not attained, not annihilated, not permanent, not arisen, not dissolved. This is nirvana. If nirvana were phenomenally existent, it would be a subject it would be subject to aging and death whatever is phenomenally existent ages and dies if nirvana were phenomenally existent it would be compounded whatever is phenomenally existent is compounded if nirvana were phenomenally existent it would be dependent whatever is phenomenally existent is dependent if nirvana is not phenomenally existent does that mean that it that it is a non-being if nirvana is not phenomenally existent, is not necessarily a non-being. If nirvana were a non-being, how could it be not dependent? Whatever is non-dependent is not a non-being. That which comes and goes is dependent and changing, but nirvana is not dependent and changing. The Buddha has negated both becoming and dissolving. Therefore, it seems that nirvana is neither phenomenally existent nor a non-being. If nirvana were both a phenomenal existent and a non-being, liberation would both happen and not happen, but that is impossible because it is contradictory. If nirvana were both a, a phenomenal existent and non-being, and a non-being, nirvana would not be non-dependent, since both existing phenomena and non-beings are dependent on whatever causes cause them. How could nirvana be both a phenomenally existent Thing and a non-being. Nirvana is uncaused. Both existing phenomena and non-beings are caused. How can Nirvana be both a phenomenal existent and non-being?
These two cannot occupy the same location. They're like light and darkness. Nirvana is neither phenomenally existent nor a non-being. If only we could understand this. If Nirvana is neither a phenomenal existent nor a non-being, who is in a position to say so? No one in Nirvana would say so, and we can't trust someone in the world of samsara. Having entered Nirvana, the Buddha does not exist, nor does he not exist, nor does he both exist and non-exist, nor does he neither exist nor not exist. During his lifetime, the Buddha did not exist, nor did he not exist, nor did he both exist and not exist, nor did he neither exist nor not exist. There is no difference at all between samsara and nirvana. There is no difference at all between nirvana and samsara. They are both empty, shunyata of essence. The limits of nirvana are the same as the limits of samsara. There is not the slightest shade of difference between the two. They are both limited by their emptiness. Speculating about what lies beyond nirvana is pointless. Since all existing phenomena are empty of, his, of essence, what is finite? What is infinite? What is both infinite and finite? What is neither finite nor infinite? What is identity and what is different? What is permanent and what is impermanent? What is both permanent and impermanent? What is neither permanent nor impermanent? Libera liberation is the cessation of all thought, the dissolution of all plurality. The Buddha taught nothing at any time, in any place, to any person. <laughs>